Alright, uh, so the talk will be in English, so I'll make the introduction in English. Uh, I'm very delighted to welcome uh, Britt. Uh, Britt was one of our owners until very recently when she got her PhD from the school and uh, went to MIT, where she's now a part of college. Uh, Britt has earned uh, or received uh, lots of prestigious awards for her work, including from the Vatat and uh, Schmidt Insurance Foundation. Uh, and uh, we'll hear about their exciting work on uh, data tools to accelerate scientific discovery. היי, שלום לכולם, אני מאוד מאוד מתרגשת להיות כאן, נורא הרבה יותר צופים שאני זוכרת ושאני מרגישה כובד המעמד שסטודנטים שמרצים שלימדו אותי שאני הייתי סטודנטית ועכשיו באים לשמוע על המחקר שלי, אני מקווה שיהיה לכם מעניין וכמובן שתשאלו שאלות וכל דבר גם לקטוע באמצע, לחכות לסוף, להפסקות מתודיות אבל אני אשמח לענות על כל דבר. אם יש עוד שאלות שלא הספקתי לענות עליהן במהלך ההרצאה או שאתם מרגישים שעדיין יש דברים שהייתם צריכים לשמוע עוד, אשמח להמשיך לדבר במייל, בזום, בכל דבר אחר. אז אני אתן את ההרצאה באנגלית, אבל מי שרוצה לשאול שאלות בעברית, כמובן אפשר גם לשאול שאלות בעברית, פשוט הרצאה באנגלית כי זה נוח לי יותר, אבל אשמח לשאלות בכל שפה. אז כמו שאמרת, אז אני עשיתי כאן את הדוקטורט שלי אצל אחת ויחידה טוב המילות שיושבת פה, אז אני אספר בהתחלה במחקר, אני אספר קצת על, אני אתחיל לדבר קצת על חלק מהמחקר שלי בדוקטורט, ובהמשך נדבר על מחקרים, על דברים אחרים שאני עושה עכשיו בפוסט דוקטורט, שכיוונים קצת שונים, אז אני מקווה מאוד להספיק להגיע לכל החלקים האלה, אז אני מתנצלת מראש שאם יהיה הרבה שאלות אני אולי אצטרך חלק מהם פשוט להגיד שנדבר עליהם אחר כך כי יש הרבה דברים שאני רוצה לספר לכם כאן היום ולנצל את הזמן לספר לכם על המחקר אוקיי, נעבור לאנגלית So, currently I'm doing my postdoc at MIT, at CISL, at a specific group that calls the data system group, data system and AI Even though I call myself data management, this is the data system group If you want to hear more about the difference, we can talk about it later on. I'm still not sure that I understand uh, the, all the difference. Um, so we're going to start with a short overview on my research. I'm going to uh, describe you my main motivations and the goal of my research. Then I'm going to present two example works of things that I did uh, uh, to target those goals. The first one is an example uh, work that I did during my PhD. And the second one is ongoing work that I'm working with my current group uh, at my uh, postdoc. Uh, and then I'm going to sum up and I'm going to tell you uh, more about my vision uh, for future work. Okay, so the main motivation of my research is to bridge between the gap of raw and often incomplete data to scientific discovery. And the idea is to develop data tools for scientists that work with empirical, uh, empirical scientists that work with data who want to uh, uh, and make scientific discovery with real life data sets. Um, and the idea is to develop tools that could be useful from scientists from multiple disciplines, including social science, natural science, and medical research. So similar to general uh, data science that conducting research, the goal of the scientists is to extract meaningful insight from the data uh, and to draw conclusion. But they have two properties that make them distinguish. So first, rather than predicting, they want to understand and explain real-world mechanism. And second, to do that, they critically rely on scientific domain knowledge. And this domain knowledge can play a significant role in multiple tasks, including defining the outliers, but also to understand what they seem to draw the conclusion, they need this a, a domain knowledge. Um, so, To, to better uh, uh, explain what I want to do, I'm going to break down the goal of accelerating scientific discovery into two intermediate goals. So the first goal of my research is to develop data tools that assist the, the scientists to investigate their data using their domain knowledge to better understand what they have. This might be useful for drawing conclusion, trustworthy conclusion from data, but also to recover previous discovery, to see if previous discovery can be found in the, in the data or to identify counter example. I'm going to give you an example in a second, so it will be uh, easier to understand. And the second goal is that in many real-life scenarios, the data that we have, it's incomplete picture of the world, 
And because the scientists want to understand real world mechanism, they have to acquire missing data, missing tuples in the data, missing rows, missing columns, but also missing scientific domain knowledge, important to understand the, their findings. So to better illustrate, uh, consider a scientist uh, conducting a, a research about the COVID-19 pandemic. I know you've heard a lot about it, but uh, this is the, the, the example, uh, so stay with me. So uh, more specifically, she wants to understand the COVID-19 mortality rate. So she investigates multiple data sets, including data about the spread of the pandemic, data about the economy of each country, and also data about the population density. And the first test, she wants to generalize from this data, from this uh, uh, detailed data into broader statements. And as I mentioned, it could be useful to investigate previous discovery, but also to make her own statement about the data. So for example, she read somewhere that the death rate for people who received the COVID-19 vaccination was higher than that of the general population. So she wants to understand if this statement, this generalization statement over the detailed data is correct or incorrect. So my first goal is to assist the scientists by doing such, such tasks of investigating data. The second task, as I mentioned, is acquiring the missing data. And in many cases, when we discover unexpected finding in the data, we need to contextualize in the data to understand what we see. So for example, the scientist sees that there is a big difference between countries uh, uh, in terms of uh, COVID mortality rate. So she wants to understand what causes this substantial effect between countries. And in this case, data that might be missing from the analysis that is uh, useful to explain this is data about the weather. It was shown to have a significant effect uh, on the COVID-19 mortality rate. So the tool that I developed will also allow the scientists to acquire this missing data that is important for the analysis and to uh, help her to draw the conclusion. Um, so during my research, I, I, uh, the main goal of my research is to develop practical tools that assist the scientists uh, to draw trustworthy uh, conclusion. But also in my research, I rely on, on uh, proof-oriented methods uh, so to have some theory behind the practical tools to make sure uh, they are uh, sound, correct, and, and scalable. Uh, the impact of my research is to assist scientists in multiple disciplines to, to draw conclusions from the data and assist them uh, to make real-world discoveries. Um, so during my PhD and my postdoc, I, I worked on those two interrelated goals and on specific subtasks such as the explainability uh, or the task of data exploration, understanding what is in the data. Uh, also on, on other uh, uh, areas, such as a uh, causal inference. And in this talk, I'm gonna present you two uh, example work, one related to each one of those uh, goals. So I'm gonna start with the first work, and this is a collaboration uh, with uh, Yin Lin and uh, Professor Jagadish from Michigan University. Yuval Moscovich from Ben Gurion University and Tova Milu. And this paper was published last year, VLD. Uh, so, as I mentioned, one of the main things the scientists or any other news reporter or politician, when they have data, people that have data, they want to make statements over those data, want to understand how can we generalize from the details that we see into statements that hold by the data. But the question is if those statements are well supported uh, by the data. More specifically, we want to understand if a statement is cherry picked. And we say that the statement is cherry picked if it's not well supported by the data. So let's consider an example. It was given by an Australian politician that said that the death rate following the COVID-19 vaccination was 58 cases per million. And it was in Australia and considered to be a lot. And he compared it into the general population and wanted to make, wanted to make it sound a lot. But if you look closely, if you look on the people that got the vaccine, you can see that most of them was, were over the age of 65. So specifically, the, uh, uh, the death rate for every age group separately, for every age group that is, you can see here in the bar chart, is equivalent to those in the general population. So the fact that it compared between the general population to the population of people who got the vaccine, it seems like it's cherry picked. He wanted to make a point, he wanted to make it sound like it's a lot, even though it would only compare it to the subpopulation of people of over the age of 65, we will get the same, um, we'll get the same data. 
Other example of stereotypic statement, so it's very hard to find those in science because usually a scientist doesn't want to lie, but luckily in politics, it's very easy to find a lot of examples. So um, for example, consider the statement was given by Sanders in uh, 2020, it was during the Democrat election. Uh, it was Sanders against Biden. And he said, even though Biden win, he said that if you look at California and if you look at people of color, in general, we won the big time. And this statement is correct. Indeed, Sanders got more votes of people of color in California, but this statement was not correct for African American. And African American is a significant subpopulation in California. And we can assume that, Sand that Sanders didn't generalize over the people of color population by mistake because he wanted to implicitly also say that he wants the, the African American vote, even though it is not correct. So this is an example of intentional cherry pick, but it can also be unintentionally. Um, so for example, doctor has overdiagnosed children with ADD and ADHD after making faulty generalization to the age of sex of children. So in this case, again, we had the, the scientists picked the wrong level of aggregation. They overdiagnosed uh, uh, girls with ADD and ADHD, but it was unintentional. So the purpose of this project is to Giving such a statement, generalization statement over the data, is to determine if this statement is well supported by the data. So to better explain how we formalize the problem, let's consider the ages in high-tech example. Um, it says that in high-tech employees under the age of 35 are more on average compared with employees over the age of 35. And I'm sorry, I'm not the one that picked the threshold of 35 to be old or not. It was the, taken from the stack overflow annual report. Uh, so this was considered to be the threshold of people are uh, uh, ages in the night. We're all under 35. Okay, <laughs> me too. Um, okay, so to formalize the, the, this problem, first we assume to have access to a database. Of course, we're the database uh, people, so we always have a database. In this case, this is a projection of the Stack Overflow dataset. It was given by people that uh, may contribute to the Stack Overflow website, and they provide annual information about themselves, such as their gender, their age, in this case is a decade. Uh, we added another binary attribute indicated whether they're over and under the age of 35, the role and their salary. So to formulate the generalization statements, um, we assume that we have some aggregated SQL query. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the SQL, those are a way to construct those bar charts. So in this case, we compare between two subpopulations employees over and under the age of 35, and we have the grouping attribute, in this case is the salary, and we compare, we compute the average salary. So to define the statement of the ages in high tech, we also assume that we have the Boolean function that describe relationships between the subpopulation. In this case, we have two groups, G1 and G2, and we say that the average uh, salary of G1 is lower than that of G2. We can use any kind of Boolean function, it doesn't really matter. Here we just use simple comparison between two groups, but this system supports any different kind of a Boolean function between the groups. So the output of the system, first it's a score between zero and one, indicated the degree to which the aggregation result represent the data. So a score of one says the statement is correct, but it's also correct for every critical subpopulation. Later on we'll define what are those critical subpopulations, but Intuitively, it will be true for every subpopulation data. And a score that is very close to zero indicates that this statement likely to be highly cherry picked because even though it's correct, there is a lot of counter examples that could be found in the data. The second uh, task that we, we target is the counter example, finding those subpopulations. So, in the age of the United the example of a counter example is the designer subpopulation. Yes. I'm missing something, but. D was the question is not about D but about the population. So the real question is: Does D represent the real population, or is there a selection bias in who who sort of gave their input to the system and who not? So the cherry pick should be with respect to the huge population, not about the database, right? No, but what if you go about the two people? Okay, I, I see your point. When you talk, when when I say the first generalization, you assume that I want to generalize to population outside the data. About 
difficult, right? About people in the high tech industry over 35, right? So this specific claim was over about this specific data set. It was the annual stuff overflow report. But in many cases, you are right. In many cases, we just have a data that is not maybe to sample from the population, but in and and for to answer this, you need something that's a bit different. But in this specific work, we can only test it on the given data set, assuming the data set is complete and well represented in the subpopulation. But you're right, in general, it could be extended also to support cases when we want to generalize outside the data and want to make sure that this statement is correct. So perhaps using the word generalization was a bit confusing. Okay, um, the second task that we uh, uh, also target is the statement refinement task. So given a, a threshold defined by the user, we want to find a better statement that better reflect the data. So in this case, a better statement that represents the data is, is instead of generalizing over the entire uh, uh, ITEC employees uh, population, we only need to say it about the developers. So developer is this big difference. So in this talk, I'm just going to focus on the first score computation task, and those two can be computed alongside the score computation algorithm. I'm not going to go inside the details. If you have anything important, we can do it offline. So why is it novel? There is a lot of uh, previous work uh, about related work. So first, there is in, in natural language, there is the fact checking work, but given a fact and a data set, we want to make sure if it's correct or incorrect. In our case, we assume that the statement is correct. It's not about identifying if, if it's true or not. It's about identifying what is the correct level of generalization that we need to use to reflect the data in hand. Uh, there are other statistical tests that want to understand if the difference is significant, uh, is statistically significant. That so, checking is also over on structured data. And you assume that there is a database with all the facts in the four kinds. Yes, yes, that's good. Thank you. So for the statistical test, uh, for example, we also saw that even though in some cases we can have statistical difference between two subpopulations, the difference, perhaps those subpopulations, uh, they represent two different subpopulations, still this is not the correct level of aggregation. Still we need to generalize over other levels of uh, aggregation. So what we are doing here is try to somehow intuitively capture how cherry pick it is and also assist the scientists to better refine the statements to reflect the data. But see, some paradox also says that there is no there's no correct way to aggregate things. So even when you try to do it correctly and not cherry pick, you still get this paradox. I agree with you. The Simpson paradox, for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's about when you find association between two attributes, and then when conditioning other attributes, the, the sign of the association changes. And it's a famous case in Berkeley that they yes. accepted the Truth yes, to women. Yes, department uh, separately more, but overall it was less. Yeah. So, yeah. so what? Basketball and everything. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. So this is highly related. But what we are trying to do here, it's also to to somehow quantify how cherry pick it is. We also identify those some subpopulation as in the Simpson paradox, but we provide a step further as refining the statement, finding those subpopulation, and somehow quantifying how cherry picked it is. Instead of the, the Simpson paradox, when you only find those one, uh, one level lower to see if the uh, Simpson paradox falls or not. But we can talk about the differences uh, uh, later on. But yes, that's a good, this is a highly related one. Um, so for the score computation, as I mentioned, we want to define those critical subpopulation. And this is where the domain knowledge uh, is critical. So some of the attributes in the, in the data set might be relevant to define the, the subpopulation, for example, the gender or, or the role of the employees, but other might be irrelevant, like the height of the subpopulation. And in this work, the way we saw that, we, we assume that the scientists provide those attributes to define the subpopulation. Later on, when I'm gonna talk about the next project about causal inference, I will offer another way to deal with it. But in this work, the idea is that this is the domain knowledge the scientists define which attributes should be used to define the subpopulation of interest. So to define the score, we use the notion of query refinement, and this is a way to refine aggregated SQL query. I'm going to give you a brief overview of how we do it using a standard data management, management operator. 
So the first way to uh, refine the aggregate uh, SQL query is to drill down. Intuitively, that means adding another grouping attributes to the group by statement. In this case, instead of com comparing between two subgroups over and under the age of 35, now we have four group comparison for every age decade. So now we have we we, we uh, get a final partition of the uh, of the group. The second way to refine an aggregated SQL query is by slicing the data. So intuitively, we can focus on specific subpopulation. In this case, is the male subpopulation compared between only male responders under and over the age of. 35. So to define the scoring, the scoring function, we want to consider two properties. Uh, we want two properties to hold in, the, in our scoring function. So the first one, we want to consider the size of opposing subpopulation. Intuitively, for larger opposing subpopulation, the score should be lower. The second property is the number of opposing subpopulation. If we have a lot of counterexample, the score should be lower. So the score definition that support those two desired property that we offer in this work is uh, um, to consider first the weight of a refined query that uh, consider the size of the opposing subpopulation or the subpopulation that qualify and the support that count the number of subgroup that support the group. So intuitively, the way we compute the score, we iterate over all possible slices of the data all possible drill down of the data defined by the critical subpopulation, the set of attributes the, the scientists provided, and we have a normalization factor to ensure the score lies between zero and one. So the next question is now we have a scoring function is how to compute the score. A naive approach will you say all drill downs if there are seven attributes and each one of them has seven different values, the number of the total number could be huge. Yes, exactly. This is the this is so the naive algorithm, as, as you mentioned, could be exponential in the number of considerable. Yes. And but the problem is that the main problem with the naive algorithm is not because it's exponential, it, of course it's exponential, but even if you have only a few attributes and only a few happen in the data set, it's still very slow. And the main bottleneck is because you have to execute each one of the refined inputs. So what we offer in this work instead. We offer an optimized algorithm that computes the exact score. So this algorithm is still exponential, but it's highly efficient, mainly because we do not execute the, uh, the refinement query at all, and we scan the data set exactly one. And this is highly critical for massive data sets. So our algorithm, even on data sets, contains millions of suckers with almost 10 attributes, still is very, very fast because we do not execute the SQL queries. I think I missed something. So you're talking about two things. One is what's the definition of a score and second, how to compute the score. And I don't understand. So here when you say, so what's what's naive about the naive algorithm? It's about the definition or? Oh, no, the, it's about computing the score. So you, we, stick we all, to the, you stick to the same definition. Yes. But you propose a different way to compute it. Yes, exactly. So. We start by defining the desired property of a scoring function, then we offer one scoring function that accounts to those properties. Now we focus on how to efficiently compute the score. Because how, yeah, but how do you justify the definition of your score? So that's a good point. In in the in the corresponding paper, uh, we run a user study and offer some use cases. Uh, we also, I'm gonna show you an example. We also implemented the system and let real-time user use it. And I'm gonna show you a real-time example, um, but that's a good- Yeah, like in general, you could, for example, use an axiomatic approach and say, okay, this definition is supported by some axioms or- I agree with you. So what we did in this work is define a desired property and offer one scoring function. But even if you slightly change the scoring function, the same algorithm that we offer will still be useful. So, because intuitively in any scoring function, you will have to consider those subpopulation. Those subpopulation needs to be, those are the ones that define the score. So even if the scoring function, instead of a, a multiplying between the support and weight, you will sum or any other definition, you can still use the same algorithm that we offer. The algorithm is more general than that. Is it answer your question? Any further questions? The algorithm is based on the dynamic programming or you know? It's very similar. Let's let's move on. Yes, it's very similar to um, dynamic programming. So we have three key observations. 
The first one that we can define a partial order between the elephant and police. So intuitively focusing on the entire developer population is more general than the female developer. And I'm gonna skip on that. And the second one is that we can enumerate the refined inquiry in a bottom-up fashion to reuse previous computation. So for example, if we know for the male, female, and non-binary developer subpopulation, we know how many tuppers we have in the data set and the aggregated outcome, in this case, the average salary, we can conclude how many developers we have overall and what is the average salary. And the second observation is that we can use a dedicated normalization table to avoid scanning the data sets and do it only once. Um, so the main idea is that we build a, a dedicated normalization table to each subgroup of, of queries that are live at the same uh, level of generalization, uh, generalization using a HAS diagram that we find, we find a partial order. And this normalization table store the information relevant to the data groups belonging to this to this level of aggregation. Then we prove that the weight of the support of every refined inquiries belong to this node in this. Heist diagram can be computed directly from the memorization table. So there is no need to execute the, the SQL query. For the most specific node, for the most specific uh, refined inquiries, we can compute the memorization table via a single scan of the data sets. And then for every other node in this Heist diagram, we don't need to scan the data set again. We can, we can use one of the children to uh, populate the normalization tables. This is the main idea uh, uh, that we do in our algorithm. Because of time constraint, I'm, I'm going to skip about the pseudo code of the algorithm because I want to move on to the demonstration. So, this question so, is, is the scope vast in the sense, let, let's take the most trivial sense. Suppose I take the database and I just split it into two parts. Will the scope? basically be the same if I sample half the points in the database? No, no, the score, no. That's, but, that's but a very good point, there? but I agree with you. So the score, the idea of this project, of the project is the data in hand, Hi. the statement represents the data. Yeah, but so suppose I take, okay, you had a big data set, I take half the data set, the score will dramatically change. Would the statement should be dramatically that What? Same thing, it's random. Yes. Just randomly, uh, each so each employee for really half I put in the data set. Will this scope, cherry pick scope, could dramatically change between, or is it very stable? It's de it's depend on the Boolean function that you defined. If the Boolean function just as as I saw in the example, as as I show in the example, was just uh, over on, uh, or under, it would most likely would change. But if you will use a Boolean function that says there is a difference of at least a range, perhaps it won't change that dramatically. The, the only thing that, that we do to, to ensure is that we, when we drill down and consider the subpopulation, we ensure that those subpopulations are big enough. We don't compare between one against million. We want to make sure that we have enough data to, to compare. To compute, but in terms of random sample from the data, we don't have any guarantees that the score wouldn't change. But that's a good point. That's an interesting uh, extension that, that we need to, to consider. We, we do not, I don't have a solution to that uh, right now. Thank you for this comment. Any further questions? Yes, you mentioned that you have some um, way to generalize beyond the data sets. I get Ishai's question is right whether you could I could rephrase Ishai's question is whether the data set that the, the score that you get on the data set reflects something about the population outside the data set because the data set was sampled to be from that population. Yes. So but you mentioned you have some alternatives that could generalize beyond the data set. By wondering whether maybe maybe you've got it wrong. Uh, no, I, I said that this will focus on whether this specific data set yeah, yeah, supports the statement. Right. Have some other ideas, maybe that yes, I, but I will talk about it uh, later in the second project. Okay, so I can answer if, if you don't understand what is the, the answer, we, we can talk about it. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the demonstration and we'll move on to talk about uh, the second project. And um, sorry for that. 
But the idea is that we can use, uh, this is a, a screenshot from the real system that a way, how can we use it? Um, if you're interested, in, uh, I can share with you uh, that later on. Okay, so the next project is about, uh, the second target is about acquiring missing data. And this is a collaboration uh, with uh, my postdoc advisor, Professor Michael Caparea, Ivan Moscovich from uh, Ben Gurion University and Babak Selini from uh, San Diego University. And as I mentioned at, at the beginning, in many cases, we just don't have enough data to understand what we see. And we need to, to contextualize our finding. We need to explain what we see using other uh, uh, data. So in this work, again, we focus on aggregated SQL query, and we want to explain those unexpected results. So looking on the aggregated SQL query, we compare between subpopulation, and this is why we expose correlation in the data between the grouping attributes and the um, outcome attributes. And a key observation is that in many cases, the only reason that we're seeing this uh, association is because of confounding bias because there are other factors that affect the association and we want to reveal those confounding attributes. So the, the, the main goal of this project is giving an unexpected uh, aggregated SQL query result, we want to find a set of confounding attributes that, to explain the unexpected correlation. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with confounding bias, this is a very uh, famous example. Uh, it was uh, found by a um, a researcher from Ben Gurion University, I think so, and one of them from other university. And the idea is that uh, they investigated data about people coming to judges to ask to shorten their uh, sentence to for parole. Uh, and those researchers look at the data and they found that a more a request get rejected when it's closer to lunchtime. And they were concluding that where judges are uh, more uh, hungry, they tend to be more tough. A few months later, other researchers uh, uh, got the same data and wanted to better investigate it. And I just want to mention that for the first, uh, for the first paper, this, it got thousands of sites and it's considered to be a lot for social science. And the second one, they look at the same data and they say, oh, there's other factors that you overlook. Like people from different jails are, are arriving to, to, to court at different time of the day. People with lawyers tend to arrive early in the morning. And they found that when considering those other factors, there is actually no association between time of, time of day and how tough a jealous looks. So this is a classic example of confounding bias. We found an association that seems to be correct, but it was affected by other unconsidered a, a factors such as a different jail. As another example, this is a projection of the COVID-19 data set. And this is the aggregated SQL query compared between the death rates of different countries. So in this case, the association is between the country and the death rates. And we want to understand why is such a big difference. So some clues can be found in the input data set. So for example, the number of confirmed cases is highly correlated with the number of death rates, but they are outliers. So for example, Germany and Italy have almost the same number of confirmed cases, but a very big difference in death rates. So our key observation is that those confounding attributes in many cases are missing from the data. And what we offer in this project is to extract those unobserved confounding attributes, those missing uh, attributes from external sources. So in this example, it could be attributes regarding the weather, population density, or health, health outcome of the country. Why is it novel? So there is a lot of works on uh, explaining uh, aggregated SQL queries. Um, many of them focus on the provenance of the, uh, of the query, trying to investigate it, uh, which tuple affected the result, or also the entire input data set. This project is novel because we offer not to focus only on the input data set, but also to consider external data sources, such as knowledge graph or uh, data lakes. So what we do here is a two-step approach, which the first step, we automatically mine the unobserved variable from external sources using data integration uh, tools. So for example, uh, this is an example table that we extracted from a data lake, which you can extract different attributes about the population density and population size of countries, or from knowledge graph. 
So for each one of the country, we can match the country into its unique entity in the knowledge graph and extract properties about the country, such as uh, the HDI and gene. At the second step, we we, what we want to do is to find the subset of potential companion attributes that explain the correlation between the a grouping attribute and the outcome. Because I don't have a lot of time, I'm just gonna skip on, a, a, on the results, but intuitively we formalize it in, into a, a optimization problem, which we want to minimize the conditional mutual information between the outcome attributes and um, the grouping attributes. So uh, I'm gonna skip on but, the details. But, but so if, if you have enough confounding variables, you can explain almost anything, right? Like if, 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 you, if they give you a large enough, you have a finite a database, if they give you a large enough subset of, of confounding variables, at the end, so you get, it, it could explain everything. So this, that's a good point. First, I want to make sure that in this case, in this world, we just find potential confounding attributes because we only measure correlation. We don't argue anything about cause effect relationship. No, no, so not just but if, we, if you take enough you explaining, can, confounding, whatever you want to call it, variables that they can condition on them, you can explain everything. So I agree with you. You can always find spurious correlation in the data. First, we make sure that we get real functional dependencies. So we want condition on the same, like for example, if we want to country, you have a functional dependency between country and country code. So given country code as an explanation is not meaningful. So I skip the details of the project, but we make sure that the attributes that we consider are not, do not have functional dependencies between the treatment or the outcome. So if it's a correlation, it could be superior correlation, but it's not a functional dependency. So it's not non meaningful expansion. But yes, one of the main limitations of this work is focusing only on correlation, not causation. We don't have any way to argue this is a real confounder. This is only potential confounder. Maybe Ishai's question is about overfitting. Yes, finding an yeah. explanation that is really, really big, that a huge subtle variable, which is not the real reason. In the previous work, you, you, you worked the other way around. You, you excluded the high because you knew that it's highly unlikely to be relevant. So you exclude, excluded it. Now you're bringing in back the high and maybe many other things that you can pile on because you have the data. So something will correlate. So in our, in our formulation of the problem, we are looking for the minimal size. We also consider, I simplify the definition, but we also consider the cardinality of the size because we want to find smaller, smaller set of size. But yes, intuitively, one of the outputs could be a set of 10 attributes. We also have some other assumption, which hold in practice, we assume there is no soul-like correlation. There is no kinds of attribute which individually each one is irrelevant, but only in the presence of, of others, suddenly it's become an explanation. The only reason that we use this assumption because we couldn't find it in real life. So in real life, like I said, that we experiment, usually the set of attributes is very small and they're, they're they are unredundant. So this is an example of explanation that we find for, for the COVID. So we find that the explanation to explain the correlation is, is a, we didn't limit the size. This is the, the optimal solution according to, a, a, to our problem definition and what, which our algorithm found that the way to explain the unexpected correlation is the HDI rank, which is reflect the, the health outcome and the economy of the country. GDP which is another attribute that a, correspond to the economy and the number of confirmed cases. And intuitively that means that in countries that have a similar economy and similar, similar health outcome and similar number of confirmed cases, we expect to find a similar death rate. And in practice, indeed, this is the case. We didn't intentionally say the, the, the system look for this. We overpopulated the system with tons of irrelevant attributes. In this case, it was over 800 attributes and the solution was a, a con a set that makes sense. Um, well, the weather, I thought from the example in the beginning, the weather also made it. Also, the healthcare uh, systems approach to this is not Sure, it's not okay. We didn't find this set not completely make those two attributes independent. No, but you assume that there is always a set of gold attributes that are the reason of this in the data set, right? 
there in, in this case it's HDI and GDP, there are always attributes in this data set or the data lake itself that are the factors leading to this. Yes, yes, yes. Well, we're only limited to what we, but we actually found it where there was not one of those attributes, even though we tested and and we said we said that in terms of the mathematical definition, it wasn't. And there is a lot of examples of countries that have a similar weather, but different uh, death rates. Surely the US is not a counter example because it has high GDP, high HDI rate, and the. But a very low health outcome. The health outcome of the US. But yes, this is not a perfect explanation because we couldn't find a perfect explanation that completely explained. But yes, for the US, the main reason is the low health outcome, very high GDP. High number of confirmed cases, but very low health outcome. I think that's what the student had a lot of cases and HDI very So, Rick, can you just uh, say uh, you skipped those slides, but can you just say in one or two sentences what's the result? Yes. So, what we did, we formalized it as a minimization uh, uh, problem, and then we we provide an algorithm that given the number k can compute the optimal solution, but k is unknown. So instead we define a, 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 a heuristic way to stop this greedy algorithm finding, so this is, we don't have guarantees on, on the overall uh, algorithm because we only know to prove when the size of the optimal solution is given. Um, but we show that in practice this algorithm is highly useful. We also provide sufficient condition to detect and handle selection bias, which might be caused because we extracted a lot of attributes that are sparse. So for example, if we extracted only the HDI of very uh, GDP of very rich countries, you might have concluded the GDP is irrelevant. So we have other conditions to select and to handle selection bias, ensuring the explanation that we generated are robust to missing data when missing values in the columns. What's um, the complexity of the algorithm? This is a linear time algorithm, the number of factors that we expect, but it was highly uh, efficient. Even of like, we expected over uh, 800 attributes and we find this, the, the explanation in a number of seconds. And so it's linear and the explanations are always one attribute? Or no, the explanation it, is our set of attributes. And the explaining variable can be any function of that set, like a ratio of two attributes or- The what? Like a ratio. So, so for example, the ratio, the ratio of attribute one divided by attribute two is the explaining variable. It, no, no, okay. only the set of attributes. We started out and we're looking for a set of attributes. Yeah, not, we're not generating other combinations of attributes. Yeah, okay. but, but it might be useful to do that. that that's a good point, maybe. Whether times economy is actually the explanation. Okay, um, I'm going to skip on that because I only have a few short minutes and I want to talk a bit about my uh, future uh, research. So, as I mentioned, uh, my goal was to develop tools to assist scientists to investigate their data using a domain knowledge and to acquiring a, a missing data uh, to bridge the gap between the raw and incomplete data and scientific discovery. Um, in my future research, I'm going to focus on causal inference and developing tools for causal inference. So causal inference lies at the heart of social and natural science. And this is the way that scientists in other disciplines try to understand and explain the real world. And to do that, there is a lot of data challenges that need to be overcome, such as missing data that may lead to confounding bias or selection bias, raw data, how can, for example, they translate their scientific domain knowledge into data preparation step, and also high dimensional data. Existing causal inference tool, such as DOI, uh, which is a, a Microsoft 2021 uh, state of the art tool for causal inference, cannot handle high dimensional uh, uh, data. So my vision is to develop an end-to-end -end system that the scientists can provide her raw data, which is, might be incomplete, also specify her, the, her causal question that she, she wants to ask, and the system will automatically aggregate and clean the data and extract the required domain knowledge. In this case, it's, all, it's uh, often given in the form of causal data depicting cause-effect relationship between attributes in the data. So the user can straight on, uh, straight on move on to the next step of performing uh, the causal analysis. Um, so I'm gonna give you a 
one, uh, two examples uh, uh, of ideal for future work. So for example, I consider the MIMIC3 data set, which is a data set containing a lot of information about people that were hospitalized in, in a different hospital in the um, in different hospitals. And let's assume that the scientist knows that the heart rate of adult and unborn children is a, a is significantly different. So for unborn children, it's much higher than that of the adult. If, for example, she's interested in investigating lung cancer, she needs to exclude out from the data sets the data regarding the unborn children to ensure she get a, a, she get a correct result. So the idea is taking those scientific domain knowledge and automatically translate into data preparation step. A other idea for ending in high dimensional data so as I mentioned uh, earlier, our ideal for handling confounding bias is to extract a lot of attributes. Some of them might be highly irrelevant, but some of them could be irrelevant, but very low level attributes. So for example, we can extract the zip code and the city and the country. And, and, and uh, in this case, this is about the lung cancer, exposure to different kinds of chemicals. And not only it's hard to use causal analysis tools with a lot of uh, attributes. Also for the scientists conducting the causal, uh, uh, the causal inference, it's higher to reason about those very details, uh, uh, very low level and details attributes. So our idea is to, rather than materializing the full uh, causal DAG, is to automatically build a cluster causal DAG when semant highly semantically similar attributes are grouped together, represented as a single node, but also the, the conditional independencies implied by the underlying causal DAG are recoverable from the cluster causal DAG. The idea here is to first use data integration to extract the, the, the attribute, but also to use data management tool for graph summarization and uh, graph clustering to create this cluster causal DAG. So um, to sum up, uh, the idea uh, of my uh, research is to build the next generation of data tools that assist scientists to extract meaningful and trustworthy insight from the data uh, and to abstract away the key roadblocks in, in the process, the data analysis process of making scientific discoveries. Thank you so much for all of your questions. I'm not sure that I answer all of them. And if you still have an uh, unanswered question, please email me. This is my email. Thank you for listening. Can you maybe say a little bit more about the computational scale of the experiments? Um, kind of think about the top, like what were the sizes of the data, like how long did the computation take, like for example, for the naive algorithm? You know, before that. Sure, for which one of the. For maybe the first part. Okay, so yeah, I think I have some slide for that. And yeah. Okay, so what we, we compare is that we, we have the naive algorithm, which the naive algorithm uh, naively iterate over every possible time query, executed and compute the score and wait. Wherever, so let's, let's do not consider the score, we just consider just the optimized algorithm, we use our algorithm. There's also the cube, which intuitively is an algorithm that materialize all the subgroup events before executing the queries. So this algorithm in terms of running time is highly efficient, but in terms of memory, it's highly inefficient. So what we show here is that on data sets, so stack overflow is almost 1 million tuple. We also tested on other data sets. A US census is considered mean, uh, that contains millions of tuple, but also on small data sets, such as the police killing. This is an example of data sets containing information about people that got killed by a police authority in the US. Even on small data sets that do not contain a lot of attributes, we saw the same trend. We saw that our algorithm ran significantly faster compared with the naive approach. Um, here you see that with the, the, with the cube approach, so on, it's depends on the number of attributes because when you have a lot of attributes rematerializing all the stat group, it was a, a, the cube algorithm couldn't handle it, but we couldn't handle it. We could. The main limitation of our work is the number of attributes. If we have in all of the experiments that we tested, the number of considered attributes were around not, no more than 10. 
if you will increase the number of attributes or also increase the number of, of value for attributes, our running time also going to be very slow. Our assumption was that not many attributes should be used to define those critical subpopulation. And I said in the beginning, I didn't have time to, to get to there. And this work, we left it as like an open question, how to define the attributes. The way that I think that we can automatically do it is inferring the cause effect relationship between the attributes and the only attributes we need to consider that affect the statement are the ones that have a cause effect relationship with the outcome. We wanna, for example, in the high tech, the, the high tech and the ages in high tech, we wanna make sure, for example, the gender do not affect the salary because we suspect there is a cause effect relationship between the two. So an automatic way to do it is to find those attributes that block the paths between the treatment and uh, the, the outcome. Uh, but our running time were very fast. Uh, you can see it in seconds that uh, we, we answer. Uh, it was an interactive system in a few seconds. We can compute both the score, the counter example, and the query file. And we, do our, we do it all together in one uh, execution of the algorithm. But it's still exponentially. No? Yes, it is. It's exponential. The algorithm is exponential, but we saw that in practice it worked fast. But as I said, the limitation is the number of attributes and the attribute value assignment. for one more question. Is there any connection between the work on cherry picking and work on fairness? It sounds like you're asking the opposite question. In some sense, instead of having a global decision in that sequence, it would be preserved over any small subgroup. You have a decision that you suspect might be more small subgroup that you're asking. That's a very good point. So first, yes, there is a connection and they're all connected to the same idea of making responsible responsible statement or making responsible decision over the data. Um, and I did, in, in, in fairness, they also consider that this notion of uh, attributes, we call it a critical subpopulation. In, in the fairness literature, usually it's called sensitive attributes. And intuitively it captured the same, it, it captured the same intuition that we wanna make sure that what we're saying is also true for those sensitive attributes. Mathematically, we didn't connect between the two and perhaps we can use some, uh, some of the fairness definition in order to find other types of cherry picks. And there is a lot of other research that we can do with the cherry picking. So for example, in this work, we only drill down, we only saw if lower level of generalization statement are correct. We can also try to see if a low, it was already too cherry picked, if other more a, a higher level of generalization a, are relevant. And also, a, as Ishai mentioned, to see if we can generalize to outside of the data set. And I assume that we can to better define how cherry picked is, some of the definition in the fairness literature could might be very useful. Yeah. So maybe to follow up on both Ishai and the Rotem, one thing you can do is like uh, Kleinberg and others did for fairness notions, they defined different notions of fairness and showed the trade-offs between them that you cannot have all everything that you want, all, all notions of fairness. One could think about different notions of cherry picking and thinking about trade-offs between those and they may be related, just like Rotem said, to the different notions of fairness. That's a very good point. Yes, there are some other work with cherry pick. For example, a uh, work from the uh, Jagadish from Michigan, they have a work on cherry pick thread lines to see if you see a thread line in a specific time frame, if you're gonna change a bit the data sets to the right or to the left, would the thread line now, now it's decreasing, now it will suddenly increase. And they use a completely different definition of cherry picked of like more of data permutation. What happened if we add some more uh, tuples or remove some more uh, tuples? And that's a good point that we need to, an interesting direction would be to consider the trade-off between those kind of different definition uh, for cherry pick. Because I assume you can come up with tons of different definition for cherry pick and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, there is, there is not a lot of work that we are familiar with cherry pick and we believe there is much to do in this direction. Yeah.